So my connection to Puget Sound began really early. Uh, my father was a sailing fanatic who moved out to the Seattle area to be around Puget Sound. He thought it was one of the great inland seas of the world. And so uh, <clears throat> when I was a little child, uh, every bit of summer uh, spare time that we had was spent on a sailboat. And a lot of the time we were going out into Puget Sound and, and up to the San Juan Islands in this little 26 footer with uh, my mom, my dad, and my sister. And, um, and for me, the, uh, uh, going through the locks became kind of this uh, uh, ceremonious thing. It, it, was, it reminded me of uh, uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when they go through the closet to get into Narnia or when uh, Alice goes down the rabbit hole into, into her wonderland. And, uh, and it was just so different than the lake. It, it was such a different world that you could just drop down uh, 10 to 20 feet and suddenly you, you were uh, basically in a completely different place. And so we would, we would go exploring from cove to cove, but for me the, the, the biggest thrill were, were the tidal flats. Um, especially when I was really small, the fact that you could get into a little tidal pool and see all the, all the sea anemones and the detail and the, and the hermit crabs with their borrowed shells and the uh, starfish going across the beach. and It just seemed endless and, and spectacular to me. And, uh, uh, and, and also just kind of the whole exploring of, of, of not only Puget Sound but up into the San Juans and, and into Canada, it seemed like the uh, farther north we went the more exotic it got and my dad was always in such a great mood when we were sailing it just made uh, everything feel special and so by the time I was in college at the University of Washington I, I was already thinking about uh, being a writer I was already um, considering myself a, a, a novelist in waiting although I never said that aloud but um, I um, I became really interested in, in, in reading books about Puget Sound and, and I became uh, excited about the fact that I didn't see many books, many novels that actually had Puget Sound as prominently played as, as I thought it could play in a novel. And uh, uh, the novel I was picturing, I didn't really have any idea what it would be, but I just wanted uh, Puget Sound to be the, the central character. And so. Um, uh, but then I, then I graduated and I spent the next 12 years bouncing around the country chasing newspaper jobs. And uh, I went up to Alaska and Washington DC and Virginia and then came back to uh, Spokane. And so I was back in the Northwest, but I, I was still you know, far, from, far from Puget Sound. I got a job in Portland. Um, and, um, and then finally, I, I was asked by the Seattle Times to write about the state legislature. Um, and so I came up here in, in 1998, and we, um, my daughter and my wife and I were, were exploring, uh, looking for a possible rental, and, and we came across a house that was um, on this bluff right here that, that I'm sitting next to, um, that, uh, um, that, that, that we could figure out a way to afford. And as, and as soon as I moved in here, um, I started getting refascinated with Puget Sound all over again. It's kind of like the, the place was in, was in high def. It was, it was even uh, more exotic than I remembered it. Um, and, and I started thinking about uh, you know, how, how to set a novel uh, right in Puget Sound, in fact, right in front of my house. That became kind of a, a uh, driving uh, compulsion for me. And so I spent a lot of time beachcombing and kayaking and sailing, um, just hoping that, that if I focused enough on the setting that the, that the story would rise up. And, uh, and so I, I kind of got a lucky break when, when the Olympian r ran this story about these uh, uh, young boys who discovered uh, a rare deep sea fish off a, a point about 10 miles away from here. And, um, and two things really struck me about that. One, one, that it was discovered by boys because they have the time to be out there in the summertime exploring. And, and secondly, that, uh, that it was strange why this, this weird fish, you know, this deep sea uh, creature would, would show up all the way down here. And so then I felt like I, I had a storyline. I had a, a uh, idea to have a, a summer where, where uh, I have a boy who keeps making these discoveries of, of uh, marine life that shouldn't normally be showing up. And, uh, 
and the more I the more I played with it, uh, the the more interesting it got for me. And so I started researching, and I would go out at night because the uh, the low tides were at night, and I would go out with a um, headlamp, and I would jot down my descriptions of all the sea life that was out there, and and I uh, started reading. Um, marine biology books and got hooked on Rachel Carson's oceanography books and, uh, and and what got me excited was that I thought that I could try to write a novel that was based on the premise that uh, most of us are so oblivious to the world around us that a boy who simply pays attention could come across as a genius and so um, this was the result the, the highest tide and uh, I thought I'd read a little bit from the opening pages here I learned early on that if you tell people what you see at low tide, they'll think you're exaggerating or lying when you're actually just explaining strange and wonderful things as clearly as you can. Most of the time I understated what I saw because I couldn't find words powerful enough, but that's the nature of marine life in the inland bays I grew up on. You'd have to be a scientist, a poet, and a comedian to hope to describe it all accurately, and even then you'd often fall short. The truth is I sometimes lied about where or when I saw things. But take that little misdirection away, and I saw everything I said I saw, and more. Most people realize the sea covers two-thirds of the planet, but few take the time to understand even a gallon of it. Watch what happens when you try to explain something as basic as the tides, that the suction of the moon and the sun creates a bulge across the ocean that turns into a slow and sneaky yet massive wave that covers our salty beaches twice a day. People look at you as if you're making it up as you go. Plus, tides aren't news. They don't crash like floods or exit like rivers. They operate beyond the fringe of most attention spans. Anyone can tell you where the sun is, but ask where the tides are, and only fishermen, oystermen, and deep-keeled sailors will know without looking. I grew up hearing seemingly intelligent grown-ups say, what a beautiful lake. No matter how many times we politely educated them, it was a bay, a briny backwater connected to the world's largest ocean. People usually take decades to sort out their view of the universe, if they bother to sort at all. I did my sorting during one freakish summer in which I was ambushed by science, fame, and suggestions of the divine. Part of the fuss had to be my appearance. I was a pink-skinned, 4 foot 8, 78 pound soprano. I came off as an innocent 9 year old even though I was an increasingly horny, speed reading 13 year old insomniac. Blame Rachel Carson for the insomnia. She was long dead by the time I arrived, but I couldn't resist reading her books over and over. I even read the sea around us aloud to make it stick. There is no drop of water in the ocean, she wrote, not even in the deepest parts of the abyss, that does not know and respond to the mysterious forces that create the tide. How do you read that sentence, yawn and turn out the lights? My family lived in a tiny metal roofed house on the soggy fog draped bottom of the sound where the Pacific Ocean came to relax. So um, that was the opening to that book and um, and I'd hoped that it would uh, do well as far away as Seattle but it, it uh, uh, I was lucky enough that it became a hit in England and I was able to uh, quit my journalism job and um, uh, work on more novels. So I've been writing full-time uh, fiction since then and that was uh, 2005. And uh, uh, along the way, I wrote a novel uh, set up on the U.S.-Canadian border called Border Songs. Uh, and then I wrote a novel set in Seattle uh, during the World's Fair, primarily, um, called uh, Truth Like the Sun. And, uh, and, then I, and then I was thrilled to actually get back to writing about uh, uh, this inland sea, because uh, um, the next book that I wrote and, and started researching was a book uh, about a, a family that was obsessed with sailing. So it was kind of like um, going full circle for me that I, that I was going back to the roots of my family and I was going back to all the uh, uh, sailing enthusiastic families that I'd known in, in the Seattle area. Um, and I knew uh, plenty of racers and, and boat builders and so on. So um, it was going back to the material that felt most natural to me. and. Uh, and what it ended up being is a book about a family that uh, built, raced, um, and adored sailboats. And the uh, star uh, racer in the family was the youngest, a, a uh, girl and then woman named Ruby, who had an almost magical-like 
uh, gift for sailing, all of which was very fun to write. Um, and uh, I thought I'd just read the opening page of that book. And this is uh, Before the Wind. I will find a page. Einstein wasn't a great sailor, probably not even a mediocre one. He didn't race or cruise, but he understood the pleasing mix of action and inaction and the thrill of a sunset sail into the spangled bliss. Many of us have fallen hard for all of this. On water, we feel competent and exalted, the, the glory lingering until we step ashore and trip on the curb and can't find our keys and remember our yard is overgrown and some rat died in the wall. And our mothers sure wish we lived closer. At least somebody wants more of us, but the us we want more of is on a sleek boat with a clean bottom and crisp sails with wind on the beam. Am I comparing us to Einstein? Yes. Sailboats attract the loons and geniuses among us. The romantics whose, bo whose boats represent some outlaw image of themselves. We fall for these things, but what we're slow to grasp is that it's not the boats, but rather those inexplicable moments on the water when time slows. The entire industry is built on a feeling and emotion. It's rarely the thing, or is it? Regardless, boaters are suckers. They pay more in moorage and repairs than their vessels are worth and rarely understand how swiftly rain and salt water conspire to corrode and rot, costs soaring as, viral, as values spiral. And don't get me started on racers who blow thousands to make their sailboats go half a smidge faster so they can finish eighth instead of 11th in regattas so obscure they don't make the tiniest print in the sports section. Um, so that's the opener to uh, Before the Wind. And, and for me, uh, probably the biggest thrill of that book was that it got translated into French and uh, uh, and did really well in France in, in 2018. And so I, I went traveling through there, touring through there, and um, primarily on the uh, west coast of France. And at my readings and at the interviews I did, invariably there would be French sailors uh, who would show up and, and people who lived on their boats like many of the characters in my book. And uh, and they would tell me that they were just kind of astonished that some, some guy from uh, America was writing about their life because they thought that, uh, that I was writing about them and, and the people they knew. And it just uh, reinforced for me kind of the universal uh, world of sailing and, and how uh, around the globe uh, people have similar uh, passions and, and the, the lifestyles are, are, are so similar. And so, uh, that was really a, a, uh, a pleasure for me, and it kind of brought me full circle to, get to, the, to my childhood when I remember my mom telling me that, uh, um, you know, you go out the locks and you take a right, and then you go out the Strait of Juan de Fuca, uh, you take a left and go out the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and then you're out into the ocean, and from there you can go basically anywhere, and, and it, it kind of uh, opened the world to me, um, just my, my whole understanding of of, of Puget Sound and uh, everything that, that uh, lays beyond it. I, I think um, I would just like to admit that I, I am a, uh, my, my favorite inanimate objects are, are sailboats. Um, and so I, I continue to be somewhat obsessed by sailboats, but the, the sailboats that, that charm me the most are, are the big, long schooners. And so whenever I'm out sailing and the adventurous uh, sails by, I feel very lucky. Um, and it's particularly exciting for me to see the adventurous if, if all the sails are up and, uh, and you have a, a big young crew on board who are appreciating and, and uh, getting a taste of the thrill of, of this area and, uh, and all that can be done on a sailboat here. Um, so I, I salute what you do and thank you very much.